Good morning and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Andrew Schwartz, uh, Vice President of uh, uh, External Relations here at CSIS, and I'm joined by um, two of my colleagues, Drs. Michael Green and Victor Cha, and I just want to apologize in advance for bringing such lightweights on the issue of Asia uh, to, to this briefing, but no. Uh, we're very fortunate to have two of the world's leading experts uh, on Asia, uh, both of who served in the former administration at the highest level uh, of policy making. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Mike Green, uh, who will give you a, a sort of a scene setter as to what's happening. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Um, Victor and I both worked in the NSC and planned trips like the one the President's about to take and um, have um, enormous um, sympathy <laughs> for our successors who are um, putting together this trip um, to Indonesia, Australia, and Guam, um, especially since it got delayed, which if you're the uh, guy in the front lines dealing with these governments and trying to reschedule everything is no, is no picnic, and I imagine they're pretty busy and are pulling it all together quite professionally. The trip was originally, of course, supposed to take place um, uh, uh, earlier during the spring break at uh, Sidwell Friends so that the president could bring his um, bring his family, um, and uh, it was delayed, of course, because of the health care debate um, to March 18th, and so his family won't be going. Spring break is over. The kids have to go back to school. As a dad, I'm completely sympathetic with that, too. <clears throat> um, Indonesia is, the, um, is in some ways the highlight of this trip with all respect to our friends in Australia. In fact, the Australians, I think, would be quite pleased that the president is paying so much attention to Indonesia. It is a, um, a critical and pivotal strategic country, not only in Asia, but in the Islamic world and in the developing world. Um, and uh, while the Clinton and Bush administrations uh, uh, invested in the Indonesia relationship, I think for U.S. foreign policy, it is a relationship that could do much more. Um, Indonesia is a, a pivot in the um, Islamic world. It is an, a successful example to both um, uh, Asia, uh, that democratization uh, can be successful, and to the Islamic world, that democratization can be successful. Indonesia has had direct presidential elections. Um, civil society in Indonesia, including NU and major Islamic un uh, organizations, have embraced democracy as a way to advance uh, uh, their agenda and, and, and uh, to do it peacefully and within uh, the uh, constitutional provisions of the, of the, of the nation. So um, it's a success story uh, for democracy, a lesson for the Islamic world, a lesson for countries like China and Asia. Um, Indonesia has also been successful in the war on terror. Just last week, they killed one of the um, terrorists responsible for the bombings at the Marriott Hotel. Um, I remember in 2001 and early 2002, after 9-11, in the White House, we, there were real questions about whether Indonesia might end up being the next Afghanistan. Um, and instead what has happened is the country has successfully held democratic elections, has built a um, credible counterterrorism capability, and has, has actually rolled back uh, Jemaya Islamiyah and other threats in the country. Indonesia is also important in this larger question of East Asian integration and architecture. Uh, Indonesia is the largest country in ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, now a member of the G20, founding member of APEC. So uh, for uh, an American strategy aimed at keeping the U.S. fully engaged in Asia, Indonesia is a really important partner. In many ways, I've heard people in the administration say that Indonesia will be for Obama what India was for Bush. It will be the big strategic relationship that they transform. And they come into the trip with a pretty ambitious agenda, at least initially, and I'll get back to why the, I say initially in a moment. Um, they'll announce a comprehensive U.S.-Indonesia comprehensive partnership. Um, uh, the highlights um, uh, are uh, pretty thin, to be honest, and I think one of the deep concerns in the administration is that they're going on this trip and they don't have a lot of deliverables. And when you're in the summitry business, as Victor and I were, you, you want deliverables. You want agreements, you want breakthroughs, you want to use the president's trip to, to justify leaving Washington, to, to, to show the importance of the relationship through a series of of concrete um, items. And um, for a variety of reasons, this trip is not is going to be a bit thin on uh, quote unquote deliverables. <clears throat> um, they will have an agreement on educational exchange to modestly expand, expand the Fulbright program. They are working on a very important agreement to expand military to military cooperation and education. <clears throat> uh, the problem there is that Senator Leahy 
has held up um, mill to mill exchange because he doesn't want to include <coughs> Kopassus. Kopassus is the Indonesian special forces, the Green Beret. And in the past, um, they've been involved in some pretty bad activities. Um, so the administration is working still, I think, and it will probably go right down to the wire trying to convince Senator Leahy to allow them to expand some military to military cooperation that would include Kopassus. They'll probably have to compromise by sort of getting younger officers who were who brought into the force after some of the um, viol human rights violations. And I, Victor and I have both been sort of trying to take the pulse of this, and our sense is they have not yet worked it out. Um, if, if they can, that'll be a big deliverable. Um, they'd like to do more on economics, but unfortunately, I think the economic, bilateral economic agenda is going to be rather thin. Um, you know, part of the problem is that, um, uh, that the Indonesians themselves are just not ready and have not been able to step up and, and, and answer some of these deliverables. The Indonesian government has some capacity issues in foreign policy to begin with. It's a small foreign service. It's not been terribly active internationally. It's not been terribly active with the U.S. And they're even more um, handicapped now because President um, SBY, President Yudhoyono, is embroiled in this uh, scandal, this controversy over a bank century, uh, which is a bank which is uh, which, which was involved in some questionable dealings, um, uh, ran into uh, trouble. There were charges that it was giving money to Yudhoyono's uh, political lieutenants. Um, they uh, ran into financial trouble, and the government offered a bailout of the bank uh, in the context of the current financial crisis. <clears throat> and um, the problem is that the bailout was approved by um, Yudhoyono's vice president and some of the major economic reformers, precisely the sort of economic reformers who would, do, who would, who would be working with the U.S. to have a, a, a successful agenda for liberalizing the Indonesian economy, improving the environment for foreign direct investment. These same guys are implicated in this bailout of Bank Century. And the, um, S, the DPR, the, the, the parliament, um, uh, rec last week, uh, uh, issued a ruling saying that the president and the administration were were wrong uh, to uh, bail out um, the bank. So there are there are, there's talk of impeachment. This huge scandal. Um, SBY has become very cautious, and his economic reformers are not able to m mobilize the government to get agreements with the U.S. to open up investment and things. So the economic part is also a bit thin. We're also, um, frankly, on the U.S. side, not terribly. Um, interesting right now in terms of trade strategy. We, uh, the, the President hasn't advanced the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement in the Congress. We've said we're going to do the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, uh, which, by the way, does not include Indonesia. It's, uh, it's, it starts uh, with four countries, Singapore, Brunei, Chile, and New Zealand. Uh, expands to Vietnam, and then we're in. Australia's interested. Indonesia's not in it. So there isn't much on our side that we're bringing in terms of trade liberalization in Asia generally, and there's not much we have on Indonesia. We could talk about that more if you like. So um, uh, for a variety of reasons, some of it timing, some of it scandals in Indonesia, some of it that we don't have a very ambitious trade strategy ourselves, the deliverables will be rather thin, and I think the White House is a bit worried about this. I would say, though, that um, this is one place, Indonesia, where the president's popularity really is an asset for the United States. Um, I, I think that the administration overplayed the president's biography in the trip to China, and as a result came up short. I think they've overplayed it elsewhere. But in Indonesia, President Obama is very, very popular, and his own history in Indonesia means that just the fact of a trip is going to advance U.S. interests, even if we don't get these deliverables. Uh, briefly on Australia, it's the 70th anniversary of our diplomatic relationship. Um, the Obama administration, in many ways, did not get the Asia it wanted. It, it wanted to continue building the U.S.-Japan alliance, but then it got the DPJ government in Japan. Very populous, very hard to work with. It wanted to expand uh, and elevate uh, U.S.-China relations beyond what Bush had done, but then it ran into a an outwardly um, confident, almost arrogant China, and an inwardly insecure China dealing with its own leadership succession in 2012. And if you saw Wen Jiabao's comments, you can see how difficult China is. Um, uh, so he's, he's not gotten the Asia he wants. And in Indonesia, of course, um, the big hope for a transformed strategic relationship ran aground because of domestic problems in Indonesia. But he got lucky in two areas, uh, Korea 
and Australia, uh, with Im Young Bak and with Kevin Rudd. And the U.S.-Australian alliance has really benefited from a kind of synchronicity of our political biorhythms. You had Bush and Howard, two like-minded conservatives at the same time, and then they both switched and you had two left of center um, multilateralist reformers in favor of aggressive policies on climate change, um, both very cerebral. So Rudd and Obama are actually very well um, uh, 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 configured for each other. Um, they will talk about a range of issues. I'm sure they'll complain. Both of them have been stymied by their Senates, the Australian Senate and the U.S. Senate, by conservative opponents who've blocked health care reform and climate change. They have a very similar political set of headaches to each other. Um, they have very similar views on climate change. Um, uh, uh, Australia's been very helpful in the war on terror and in Afghanistan. Um, the president won't get a significant increase in Australian troops for Afghanistan. I don't think he'll ask. Um, the, the one area where there's a little bit of, of um, uh, not disagreement, but a different temperature, is that Kevin Rudd is, is, is pushing this idea of an Asia-Pacific community, Australia's answer for the question of how you organize Asian architecture. And for the most part, the Obama administration has been kind of lukewarm about it. Um, a little bit concerned that it might um, overshadow APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, which uh, will be held in Japan and then next year in, in Hawaii. And, and I don't think the Obama administration wants anything to, to, to overcrowd that. And, and, and partly because um, there's a little bit of not invented here syndrome. If, if the U.S. government didn't think of the regional architecture, then we're not that interested. So one thing to watch on the Australia trip is how they talk about Kevin Rudd's Asia-Pacific community concept. The Australian press and some Australian observers are saying uh, Obama and Eugenio will endorse uh, Kevin Rudd's Asia-Pacific community concept, which is very vague, by the way. But, um, but we'll see. It's, it's sort of one of the things the Australian press will be watching. Guam is the last, is the only other stop, and I think my guess is Guam is a refueling stop, frankly. Um, on these trips, you always have to down, put Air Force One down to refuel. Usually you do it at a military base um, so that the president can meet with families and thank them, meet with the military officers. Guam's important strategically, but my guess is the stop is mostly to refuel. So that's a brief overview of the trip. The other place you could refuel is Japan, but that's not a very convenient <laughs> place to stop these days, I guess. Um, I think Mike covered a lot. Let me just um, add a couple of points. Um, uh, you know, Mike sort of finished by saying how this was in the Asia that they didn't expect. The other way of looking at this is, um, you know, they tried Asia one way in year one, and now they get a do-over, right? And they're doing it over again. You know, the first year, um, the focus was on China. You know, China was, as the president said at the, in the speech in Japan in November, China was central to the U.S. global agenda. And it was really all-out engagement. Um, and that kind of didn't work out very well, right? Um, and then the other area they were really focused on was opening the unclenched fist to countries like Cuba and in Asia, North Korea, right? And they got, in return for that, they got a missile test and they got a nuclear test, right? Um, and, then, um, and then the unexpected thing they got was Japan, right? The domestic change in Japan and, uh, uh, and a lot of the issues that came up there. So that was year one, and sort of year two now is the do-over year, right? They're trying it a different way. Um, uh, you know, we can talk about these tensions with China are rising over a number of issues. Uh, clearly on North Korea, a very different track with sanctions um, being the prominent aspect of the policy right now. You know, very major preoccupation with Japan uh, in terms of the new government and how they're doing this, um, uh, the realignment and the overall future of the alliance. <clears throat> and, um, and now they begin year two with the big piece of Asia being this trip to Southeast Asia right, and the South Pacific. Very unusual, right? very unusual. Um, I can't remember the last time a U.S. president made a trip to Southeast Asia, you know, only to Southeast Asia, um, when there wasn't an APEC or something like that going on. I mean, I can't remember the last time that has ever, uh, that has ever happened, because usually it's always, it's always uh, to Northeast Asia. Um, so I think this is sort of they're trying to do it over. 
Um, and, you know, one of the things they're clearly playing on is this notion that a trip like this really demonstrates how the United States is really an Asia-Pacific power, right? In the beginning, in the first year, they talked about how this was the first, you know, Asian president of the United States because of his upbringing in Indonesia. So you had a lot of rhetoric like this. This trip is really trying to put uh, actions to words, right? Trying to really show, because it is such an unusual trip to take, that uh, this is really where uh, the rhetoric of the Asia Pacific president turns into um, action. I think regardless of how many deliverables or lack of deliverables um, um, uh, we tell you about or when they, when they brief you, they will try to tell you about, no matter how many times people try to spin you, I think overall for many of you the story of the trip is homecoming, right? Uh, President's homecoming. Um, and uh, the fact that he's doing this is such a critical time here in terms of the domestic politics um, of, uh, of uh, health care. And I can certainly understand, I, I guess the one thing I would say is, um, you know, when we plan these sorts of trips uh, and you try to figure out when is a good time to take the president and his entire tail to Asia for a week or 10 days, because if you include refueling, it ends up being that long. And the answer is, there's never a good time, right? It's like family planning. There's never a good time to have your next child, right? So uh, there's never a good time to do a trip like this. Um, and obviously, many would argue that this isn't a, a particularly good time. But I mean, I think in terms, of, if we think about it from our perspective, sort of the U.S. and Asia, it is, it is a very important trip because, you know, half the battle with regard to U.S. standing in Asia is signaling, right? And what you're see, when, if the president goes at this particular time, when there are a lot of issues, admittedly, on the table here at home, that is signaling something to Asia that the United States really is an Asia-Pacific power, and it's not going to let China sort of completely dominate every aspect of this region. So I think that's, um, uh, that's an important thing. And one thing is I would like to watch carefully is sort of China's reaction to this trip. Uh, because, um, you know, this really isn't, as Mike said, it, there isn't a whole lot of policy deliverables, yet he's taking this trip, and in many ways that is Chinese diplomacy, right? The Chinese are very good at having big, you know, big trips where not a lot happens. Um, so, um, the last thing I would say about these two particular stops is we always talk about how, you know, there's a new agenda for the 21st century. Um, and this trip in many ways I think exemplifies the new agenda because these two countries, again, are not countries you would normally think of as the first stops or even any stops on an Asia-Pacific swing, uh, yet they're the two main ones. And they're, in many ways, they're two countries that really represent sort of the new agenda. Right, if, uh, the new 21st agenda. Uh, both countries, as Mike said, are a member of the G20 um, 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 for different reasons. In terms of the global war on terror, uh, you know, 21st century agenda item, Australia uh, has had a reputation for established a well-deserved reputation for punching above its weight, uh, both in Iraq uh, and in Afghanistan. And as Mike said, there's some um, issues potentially with regard to Afghanistan. Um, and um, Indonesia is absolutely critical uh, to um, the, both the fight against the global war on terror, but also preventing um, 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 the growth of uh, terrorism in Southeast Asia. On climate change, Australia is a key country in Copenhagen, and Indonesia really represents sort of the, the developing country um, 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 uh, what, what sort of commitment to this uh, global climate change agenda. Um, um, there's a big debate between the developed and the developing countries on this, and Indonesia is trying and therefore very critical to that movement. And the last thing which I think can't be um, overstated is this whole question of Indonesia representing this combination of tolerance, democracy, you know, the, a, a moderate Muslim democracy. There are not many of those around. Um, and the fact that, um, you know, the president will go there. In many ways, it's a shame that he's not going with the family because pictures, you know, of the president and the kids, you know, visiting sites and things, those, picture, those pictures can probably do more to help reframe the discussion and the discourse on Islam than 50 speeches that the president might give. So 
Uh, but in that sense, that's kind of a disappointment. But I still think he's there. He's visiting these sites. If he's speaking in the native tongue, which you know he can do if he needed to, I, guess, I would assume, uh, these sorts of things will um, go a long way in, in terms of reframing the discourse uh, on Islam.